Okay. So thank you very much, everyone, for uh, for joining us uh, today at the this uh, Johnson Shiyama uh, Graduate School of Public Policy uh, lecture. Um, it's also sponsored by uh, the Department of Political Studies here at the U of S. Uh, so welcome to uh, JSGS. It's a provincial center for advanced study and research in public policy and administration, and actually has two campuses. So the campus here in Saskatoon and the campus in Regina. So you can see uh, some of uh, our colleagues in, uh, in Regina as well. So at the end, when we take questions, we'll take questions from uh, Regina as well as from, from here. And I'd also like to take time at the moment to acknowledge that today's event is taking place on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 land and the traditional homeland of the Métis. My name is Karen Holroyd, and I'm a faculty member in political studies here at uh, the University of Saskatchewan, and I will, uh, I will be your moderator. Um, and I'm delighted today to, uh, to be able to uh, introduce to you uh, Dr. Barbara Padratova from uh, uh, Masaryk University. No, I didn't get it right. Did you check my notes? Yeah, I'm sorry. I did? I did get it right. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I was practicing beforehand, but clearly still not good enough. Um, uh, so, um, Dr. Padratova is an assistant professor at the Department of International Relations and European Studies uh, at Masaryk University in uh, the Czech Republic, and she also works as a research scholar affiliated with the Arctic Futures Initiative uh, at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in, uh, in Austria. And she's done a lot of work uh, on the Arctic and been uh, the Czech Republic delegate uh, to uh, various um, uh, working groups within the uh, International Arctic Science Committee, and she has a lot of interest in uh, geopolitics and security in the Arctic region. So we're very lucky. Um, she's on an opportunity to apply for a week uh, kind of study sort of anywhere in the world, and she picked to come to the University of Saskatchewan. So we're uh, <laughs> very good choice. We're uh, delighted to, to have her. She's a wonderful guest. She seems to like everything uh, that she's done while she's been here. So absolutely uh, perfect person to uh, to invite. So I'm just uh, delighted to introduce her, and please come on up. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you, Karen, for hosting me, for having me here. It's a really pleasure and honor for me to be here. It's my first time in Saskatchewan and in Saskatoon, obviously. Um, and I'm really uh, excited how beautiful a campus you have. I had a chance for these last days to walk around a little bit. And it's both, both days really sunny. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, you know, who has uh, fingers? <laughs> I think it's uh, just a good luck, and I'm very happy uh, for, th for this weather. And congratulations, amazing campus. And uh, what I've learned about your university, those, um, uh, those um, uh, what you've achieved, those achievements, it's, it's really remarkable. So it's really honor for me to, to be here today and share uh, some of my humble thoughts on the Arctic and security in the Arctic. That's what uh, what's my, um, I, I tend to call it passion. Um, <laughs> all right, um, we will have um, approximately 45, 40, 45 minutes of uh, me talking. I'll try not to be um, boring, so you don't have this post lunch coma tendency <laughs> to fall asleep. I'll make sure. Uh, there is enough interesting information for you, and then uh, we can have a Q&A session, so please uh, uh, prepare your questions and we can then collect them at the end. I'll be very happy to, uh, to answer your questions or hear, to hear your comments. All right, um, and we are broadcasted live to Regina, yeah. I, I believe, so hello Regina. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, with the uh, further delay, I, I, I believe we are ready to to start today. Um, what I'd like to start with it's uh, I mean I'm who I am to tell you where is the artist, right? But uh, you will wonder about many of my colleagues whenever they meet me in the hallway. It's like oh, it's how your penguin. I'm like, come on, guys. I've been doing this for years, so you should know where polar bears and penguins live. So this is uh, my favorite cartoon from uh, Humo, which is a uh, Danish uh, couple uh, who did this cartoon, uh, which says um, there are a couple of penguins talking about polar bears, and the penguin says, I agree, 
polar bears have no place on the South Pole, but why don't you just chuckle over there and tell <laughs> him that? Um, so, um, obviously, we know uh, where is the Arctic, uh, and if not, uh, we know it right now. <laughs> so, we are talking about, about the North Pole and the region uh, about the North Pole, around, uh, around the North Pole. Um, what I found really interesting is the composition of the Arctic when we talk about political definition of the Arctic. We know that we have uh, Arctic five, so those five uh, coastal states, right? One of them is Canada, um, and then Denmark via Greenland, uh, we have the United States via Alaska, Russia, and Norway, and then uh, Finland, Sweden, and Iceland. So I find it really uh, interesting to see how, actually, I like this Arctic map uh, better than any other ones, because you can nicely see how big the territory of, of each country is. And um, for Russia, it's um, if you think about it, it's more than 60% of the territory. So it's, a, it's definitely um, an important player, and uh, I will touch upon those issues, how there were discussions about overlapping some other conflicts outside the Arctic, like Ukraine, Georgia, and Syria, that might be influencing the cooperation and the security in the Arctic. Um, so I just want to um, start from, from this. And uh, talking about geopolitics, um, so we, I like these maps, although I prefer the Arctic ones. Um, these maps would be most familiar to geographers, right? But what we work with, um, these are the maps probably that we as a political scientist uh, work uh, more with. And uh, what geopolitics does, uh, geopolitics basically transforms the geography um, to, to the politics. So we see how geography can influence your your positions and your stance in, in, in the world arena and, uh, and your position in, in world politics. Um, maybe a little bit of a of historical background uh, that also has an impact on the development in the Arctic and what was happening in the Arctic um, before. And I wouldn't go really deep into history. I would start um, with, the, with the period uh, which was uh, pre-Second World War. So everything that was happening um, before 1939. And in this period, uh, Arctic was already very important and was on the radar of um, definitely of all A5 uh, Arctic, Arctic coastal states. And with the, with the approach of the Second World War, uh, between 1939 and 45, uh, its importance even increased even more. So if, if we think about it, what, uh, which operations were influenced, um, what was happening. So for example, on Svalbard, uh, the meteorological stations were very crucial uh, for air operations uh, of, of uh, of uh, Nazi who, who, who back then occupied the nor northern Norway or majority of the Norway territory. So uh, radio stations, meteorological stations, uh, weather stations, all of these were based in the Arctic and they were one of the reasons um, or factors that actually influenced all those operations. And even now in some parts of um, some some parts of Svalbard and northern Siberia, uh, with the climate change and with the uh, melting permafrost, as you probably noticed, they are they found different artifacts from that period of Second World War, uh, including documents which were very very well preserved thanks to uh, thanks to the climate and many other artifacts from those spaces that were based in the Arctic during the Second World War, so what was, what was happening there, and um, yeah, including bones of polar bears, so they realized that actually 
they hunt, they kill polar bears, probably with guns, not with <laughs> their own hands, like the uh, majority of indigenous would do, but uh, they, they actually ate polar bears and, and uh, many other interesting facts actually were just discovered thanks to the preservation of, uh, of, uh, of those spaces um, in, um, under, the, under the ice. So that was a period during, uh, during the Second World War. And then, uh, of course, Cold War um, was, um, the Arctic was right in the center of those relationships between the USSR, uh, Soviet Union, and the United States. And I put here um, the year 1975. Anyone would guess why, why 1975? Um, why that would be different? Oil crisis? Something regarding the Arctic and cooperation in the Arctic? Mm -hmm. Thinking about USA and Canada dual line divided the North Pass. Once again? Um, the dual line, many bases that the American government installed. Mm -hmm. At the border of the Arctic, but I don't know if it, if it was around that year. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, in November 1975. It was a moment where you can imagine it was the deepest time of the Cold War. It was a moment when actually all Arctic states were able to come and to sign a treaty of protection of polar bears. So even during the deepest time of conflict between the US and the Soviet Union and other Arctic states joined them, they were able to, uh, to come to, to find a solution for protection of polar bears because it was, that was the period when um, the interest to hunt polar bears, uh, the commercial hunting was on the rise and uh, in Arctic states uh, they pretty fast realized, pretty quickly realized that polar bears might be um, endangered by, by this trend. So um, that was really interesting. If you think about it, you have those two blocks opposing um, all those proxy wars happening on, uh, on other territories around the world, but yet they were able to come to cooperate. So my point here is that even during the deepest time of, of the Cold War, or of the, um, of the conflict um, between those two blocks, those countries were able to cooperate. So the cooperation was really, throughout the history, uh, very important for, for Arctic studies, because they realized that what is happening in the Arctic obviously doesn't stay in the Arctic, and vice versa, vice versa what is happening outside the Arctic has an impact on on the development of the Arctic. So that was, um, that was really interesting for me to realize that even though we tend to think, all right, Cold War, we have two blogs, no discussion, no talks, uh, the Arctic was right in the, in the middle of that and was strategic, was of, a, of a strategic importance um, for, for cooperation. Uh, while we are also aware of that, that was the closest um, um, closest uh, territory for both parties for uh, missile um, attacks and for, for ballistic missiles to potentially uh, uh, send uh, the missiles over the polar cap. So uh, it was the shortest distance also for, for submarines and, and for potential naval operations. And then um, 1996, uh, the period which I would call uh, the first post-Cold War period. Um, any ideas why 1996? Arctic Council? Yes, uh. all right, <laughs> well done. Uh, yes, that was the year when Arctic states realized that um, this nice we have the International Polar Bear Treaty, but we need to do more and they realized the huge pollution, uh, the huge military pollution uh, from uh, nuclear waste and uh, nuclear arms that were left after the Cold War, especially in, in Russian part of the Arctic. So the, the uh, Kola Peninsula 
those regions around Murmansk and Apatiti and those, those regions that were heavily militarized uh, had a lot of nuclear waste and Russians didn't have uh, neither, uh, neither the knowledge nor the money to do that. Um, so it was a moment when um, especially Finland and Norway stepped in and in a cooperation with Russia helped them to get rid of, uh, in, a, in a safe way, to get rid of the all the uh, majority of the nuclear nuclear waste back, back then. So there was, a, there was a peak when they realized, all right, we have a huge issue and we need to cooperate together to be able to, uh, to overcome and prevent any further uh, uh, environmental disasters. So there was a pollution, the, the military uh, pollution or uh, pollution caused by uh, caused by um, by military equipment. Then um, oil spills. There was um, a rise of uh, of the extraction of oil in the Arctic, and uh, oil spills became uh, an important issue uh, and um, threatening factor for the fragile Arctic environment. So there was important for them to uh, sit around the table and discuss what we can do to prevent oil spills. And if this happens, what is the procedure uh, uh, and what we will do if this happens on the border or on the, on a, on a territory where actually our countries share the border or if it's uh, uh, on, the, on the coast or, or f further um, uh, from the coastline. And in the third position, uh, third, uh, third um, uh, factor that, uh, that uh, spurred the cooperation uh, was, uh, was the economic development and sustainable development and protection of indigenous peoples. That's what the Arctic Council aimed from the very beginning, that they need to focus on indigenous peoples because uh, before rights of indigenous peoples, it wasn't as, as we as we know it right now, that indigenous has, uh, I mean, they have all equal rights as a, as a locals and, and other, let's say, Canadians or, or Russians. Uh, yet, uh, back then, it wasn't, it wasn't really uh, clear and uh, rights of indigenous peoples were not defined. So the Arctic Council took an initiative to protect indigenous peoples' rights. And they decided on the top of that that they will focus only on those uh, soft issues, so soft uh, security issues, and they will leave military and uh, hard security issues aside. So even though we have Arctic Council as probably the best institution, the best platform we might have in the Arctic for promotion and, and strengthening cooperation, they avoid military uh, security issues. So that's been uh, again. I will I will come to that, but it, that's been a discussion um, in uh, uh, around uh, I mean all around the Arctic whether uh, the military issues and military security shouldn't be considered as being part of the agenda um, after the crime, especially after Crimea in 2014. But yet they they decided not to not to include the security the military security. Um, the issues, uh, the hard security issues in, in their agenda yet. Um, and then uh, the last period, or the second post-Cold -post, uh, War period, I, I put the, the year 2014, because even though we, uh, we know that in 2008 uh, the developments in Georgia and uh, the uh, uh, Russian uh, annexation or occupation of two thirds of Georgian territory. Please come ahead. There is still <laughs> one seat, two seats <laughs> left in the front. So even though we knew in, in 2008 that um, that Russia uh, illegally uh, occupied two thirds of uh, of Georgian territory, it was still considered to be. Uh, Far away from uh, from the Arctic and from the Arctic Council. Um, however, uh, 2014 annexation of Crimea and 
and Russian uh, military operations in East Ukraine uh, marked uh, the, the, that was the moment when other Arctic states uh, realized that uh, we cannot afford to have a player uh, who, who wouldn't respond, uh, who wouldn't um, um, respect the international law. So we need to take steps to, to prevent this from happening in the future. So that's why I put 2014, and um, we can also come back to that later. But it was a moment when, uh, when some of the cooperation platforms were uh, basically stopped and were not renewed until today. But the impact and the spillover uh, wasn't as um, as tragic as uh, as it was uh, perceived or uh, as they um, as they uh, thought it might be, because um, still those issues that are important for for the Arctic states are more important um, or are on high priority for them. There is still one place here. <laughs> Uh, are still on the top of their priorities, so they uh, they want to make sure that we still cooperate on those issues that we wouldn't be able to deal with as a single country. Um, so that would be a brief um, fast train uh, excursion throughout the uh, modern history of, of, of the Arctic to give you a little bit more of, uh, of the background of the, of the historical context. Um, anyone would recognize this gentleman? Perry. Perry? Yes. Yay! <laughs> Robert Perry, yes. Um, do you remember what, what was the year when, when he actually um, reached the North Pole? <laughs> I'm just testing you. All right. <laughs> it was uh, 1909 when uh, Robert Peary uh, reached North Pole as the first uh, explorer, uh, first successful uh, explorer, and um, this is the picture from uh, from the expedition. And uh, you heard about the story that there was actually five people expedition, and then one of them was. Uh, eaten by, uh, by a polar bear, right? No? <laughs> no, the fifth one is taking the picture. Ah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that, would be, um, that would be an insight to, to, to the history uh, of, uh, of exploration and of dynamics of, uh, of, of the Arctic. But when I uh, go back to geopolitics, as I mentioned in, in the beginning, um, we know that geopolitics tends to change uh, as a historical periods and structures of world order change. So we know that um, it's nothing that would be static. So it's something that is always changing and adapting to changes and to, to the developments that, uh, that uh, are happening in, in the world and how, um, how different countries and their interests uh, in different periods um, changes. So uh, if we think about the geopolitics of the Arctic 10 years ago, it would be different than 50 years ago or what is right now. Uh, I mean, the last uh, two, three, four, five years. So it's also, um, I, I think it's, it's important to, to, um, to realize that actually we, we don't have one geopolitics of one Arctic. There are many Arctics within the Arctic, and um, there's a huge diversity uh, from all different perspectives, language-wise, culture-wise, um, um, indigenous peoples, uh, in, livelihood wise and all the different differences that the Arctic uh, has and how geopolitics is diverse and was diverse throughout the history uh, also uh, also has a um, um, has an important place so we need to make sure that we don't refer to geopolitics geopolitics of the Arctic as, as one 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 thing so it's very diverse and it has been changing throughout throughout the history um, and if we think about what um, geographical uh, changes can affect, so 
that's absolutely uh, one of the most important is the political constellations and hierarchy. So these would be the factors that, that influence that. Uh, also interactions of, uh, of the state, so state with the other state or states, and uh, states and non-state actors, which uh, talking about the Arctic, it's a beautiful example of how states really cooperate with with uh, non uh, with non-state actors, because uh, thanks to the protection of, of the environment and all those initiatives of uh, NGOs, uh, I mean, uh, you can mention Greenpeace, uh, Worldwide Pan, uh, many many other uh, international organizations that uh, that care about the Arctic and protection of the environment in the Arctic has a strong say in the development. Uh, of the Arctic, and not to mention that uh, many of those countries are observers or uh, permanent participants of the Arctic Council. And especially in case of the Arctic, um, those five Arctic states have uh, primary access to, to trade and to world seas. So for them, um, the fact that Norway has a territory in the Arctic, or Canada has a territory in the Arctic, um, then foreign policy priorities and potential, what you can actually utilize and, and how you can economically develop, it gives you uh, the fact that, that your territory of your country is based where it is, gives you a different um, different opportunities than, for example, a country which is so unimportant and so small, like, for example, the Czech Republic being in the middle, uh, land or country in the middle of, of Europe. So these, these are things that influence um, the, the geopolitics of, um, of the Arctic. And it brings me to, to discussion of how regional challenges and regional security influences the global security and vice versa. So how global developments influence uh, the security and the developments in the Arctic. And I think it's, it's nice to divide that um, or to realize that we have, um, let's say, military security of one uh, single Arctic state. So we have, um, let's say, Canada and Canadian foreign security policy would focus on, on the interests and protection of those interests of, uh, of Canada in the Arctic, meaning if there is a, an external threat towards the Arctic, uh, towards uh, Canada and uh, Arctic parts of, of Canadian, Canadian territory, uh, that's the point when the government, government needs to take steps to protect these, uh, these interests. While we have a common security of multiple states, meaning that we have those threats and challenges like um, the ones that I've mentioned, environmental challenges and, and uh, environmental threats, pollution, uh, etc. Um, newcomers to the Arctic, China, um, other Asian, India, other uh, Japan, other Asian states that uh, recently expressed enormous interest in the Arctic. And these are challenges and security threats, potential security threats, for all the Arctic states. So these are the challenges and, and security threats that they need to come together again. And only through the cooperation they would be able to, to face it and to fight those those challenges. So as I as I already mentioned, uh, we have five Arctic A5 uh, coastal studies, from uh, which four of them are NATO members, and then we have Russia. And how this constellation influences the security in the region, and how developments like Ukraine and Georgia and Syria and other parts uh, of the world influence security in the Arctic. That's, that's important to, uh, to distinguish or 
of what, what is really uh, the top priority of each country. So if we think about, um, again, let's say, uh, like, let's take an example of Canada. So uh, being a NATO founding member, while having a huge neighbor in the Arctic, and knowing how, how many difficult challenges we need to face in the Arctic, including search and rescue and, and other, uh, other infrastructure, which is still throughout the Arctic, very, um, uh, it's lacking and it still needs a, a lot of investment and development. Uh, I need to decide what, what is my top priority and how I will communicate this with my partners. So even though I might condemn what Russia did in, in Ukraine, I might not um, agree with those steps. It is still important for me to say that regarding this region and these problems, these issues, I want to cooperate. So sometimes you might see um, contradictory messages in, in, in news and media, right? And you might see, all right, uh, especially, I mean, during the period of, of your former Prime Minister, uh, Stephen Harper. Uh, Russians are coming, let's build up our army, let's militarize the Arctic because they will threaten our security in the Arctic. Um, yes, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you need to make sure that even though those messages of politicians and uh, government representatives uh, communicate how they condemn, how they disagree with Russian steps in other parts of the world, and which is correct, they vote in NATO, uh, they vote in other uh, Arctic states, in the EU, they vote for, for sanctions, they support it. At the same time, they do cooperate with Russia in the Arctic because it's important for them, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's simply too important uh, to, to isolate Russia and not to, not to cooperate with them. And to, uh, to give you a little bit more of a, of a number perspective, I apologize for those of you who were um, my, to my presentation yesterday in the Canadian International Council, but I promise these are only three slides that will overlap. <laughs> I think they are uh, too important to, to skip them. And it took me quite a long time to prepare, so I need to make sure it reaches enough audience. Um, so this is, a, this is a table of uh, military expenditures by, by each Arctic uh, state. Uh, these are numbers by, uh, by CIPRI in 2017. And from these numbers, I made, uh, I would say, rather illustrative um, figures. So you can see here, uh, the current U.S. military, uh, U.S. sorry, <laughs> U.S. Uh, million uh, dollars uh, in 2017. The United States, 609,780, 59, 58, sorry, <laughs> uh, million U.S. dollars invested in military, while Russia. Not working. Anyway, Russia being in the second place with a uh, little bit more than 10% of, of the US investment. Of, of course, these numbers are the numbers for whole countries. So it's not the Arctic, um, you know, it, it's really hard to just to take aside uh, or focus on those investments in the Arctic because you have some military capabilities that are used in the Arctic while they use them in other parts of the world. So. Uh, however, to give you uh, to give you a little bit of of, uh, of, a, of a perspective, how threatening actually Russia might be, um, not really, right? So if you think about how strong Russia is, this is one of the numbers, one of the figures that give you an idea that they are actually not as strong as they are uh, quite often um, perceived. Uh, Another table shows um, numbers by per capita, which, uh, which changes a little bit, while the United States are still the first one, uh, followed by Norway, Denmark, Finland, Canada, Sweden, and Russia being here the last one uh, with 460.7 uh, 
uh, per capita spending. Uh, I mean, of course, we have Iceland as the last one, but um, we know that even though Iceland is a NATO member, they don't have their own army. So that's why um, we, we, we don't uh, count, uh, count with them. And just um, another two, two figures where you can see uh, the share of government spending and the share of GDP uh, and, uh, and, and the numbers you can, you can make a, a picture for yourself uh, how um, where Russia and the United States and the rest of the Arctic, uh, Arctic stands. And if you think about NATO and this um, ideal 2% investment in, in defense and military expenditures. Um, I think I, I didn't put the, the figure here in my presentation today, but very few, I think currently it's only five NATO members out of 29 uh, who are able to reach 2% uh, for their own defense. Um, so these are numbers that can give you a little bit of, of a perspective how uh, how uh, Russia, U.S., and other Arctic states stand. And um, probably this would be um, the last topic I would like to focus on: those common security threats. So we had those uh, those threats that um, that are more of our individual countries perception of security, which we know is very subjective, right? If I feel threatened by you, it's very subjective because uh, I might like you, how you look, I, it might be appealing to me uh, when we talk to each other. However, to your colleague on your right, it doesn't, it, it doesn't work like that, but whatever I perceive, uh, you have to see it in the same way. So uh, what one country perceives uh, being secure or being threatened, um, differs from other uh, other Arctic states. Even though I might be um, a neighboring country and we might have a similar geopolitical um, uh, perspective or geopolitical uh, uh, foreign policy interests, it doesn't mean that the perception of security of the threats would be the same. So. Um, when we talk about the individuals, uh, individual countries' uh, perception of security, uh, these are the common security threats that all the Arctic states uh, need to deal with, and they are not able to, uh, to be dealt with only by one single country. And these include, among others, uh, criminal activities including smuggling, piracy, illegal fisheries. These are the topics and uh, security threats that face all the Arctic states, uh, and of course non-Arctic states, but since we are talking about the Arctic, especially those coastal, coastal states in the Arctic. Already mentioned environmental disasters, so oil spills, pollution, uh, erosions, uh, nature degradation, uh, deglaciation, and all of these, they do not respect the borders of, of a single country. So these are, these are the factors and threats that uh, they need to come uh, together uh, and they are in all the Arctic states to, to be able to, to, to face and, and prevent um, in, in the best uh, case scenario to, to prevent them. And new challenges connected to to the economic development, um, and by these I mean the increased natural resources extraction, um, increased shipping connected to uh, to polar code. Anyone heard about it? Probably yes. Some of you, yes. Some no. Uh, polar code defines what kind of ship you need to have, what kind of uh, requirements you need to fulfill in order to be able to sail in the Arctic. So there are special requirements for the fuel, uh, how it is burned, etc. I'm not a technician, but from, from the big picture I know it's all about the ships and, and those requirements you need to have in order to be allowed to sail in the Arctic. Another interesting factor 
uh, the boom of tourism in the Arctic. And you've probably uh, noticed, it was all around the media, uh, the Crystal Serenity, right? which uh, sailed uh, from, from Canada uh, throughout the Arctic for the first time, the first uh, cruise ship uh, with, uh, I think, 5,000 people on board, more or less. And um, these are really interesting um, factors in case of tourism. If you think about how climate change uh, and the weather conditions has changed or have changed throughout, uh, throughout the, the period of time, if, if you are a tourist on uh, Crystal Serenity or any other cruise ship, tourist cruise ship, and you, you depart from Canada, let's say from some southern part which would be non-Arctic... Um, Prince Rupert. For example, or Vancouver. Definitely nothing you would connect to the Arctic. Um, you have your shoes. You have bacteria, you have potential seeds in your shoes, and suddenly you are on the board of a cruise ship which goes to the Arctic, and at some point you hope that you will get off the boat so you can take nice pictures and see polar bears and, um, and show your friends on Facebook and Twitter how cool you are. <laughs> However, whatever you bring with you, you bring it to the Arctic, so then it, it causes the uh, infiltration of alien, thank you, <laughs> alien species interference in the Arctic environment. And even though, um, let's say, 20 years, 30 years ago, it wouldn't matter because they wouldn't be able to survive in the Arctic environment, thanks to the climate change and warming environment. Um, Maybe not oranges, but something less tropical would be able to survive. And actually, thanks to that, you bring it there. They would be able, the plants would be able to, to grow. Not to mention different types of bacteria that might be uh, very harmful for the environment and for the animals living living in the Arctic. So these are these are uh, very interesting factors that we might not think. Uh, in the first place, when we talk about tourism, not to mention how tourism influences um, uh, basically the whole um, the whole livelihood. So, if you think about the regime and daily uh, daily regime of a small um, port of uh, Akureyri, which is in, in northern Iceland, and it's a, it's a place that I was lucky enough to spend a few lovely cold and freezing months, and it was the summer, so it was the hottest period of the year, um, that's what they say. Um, and this port is, uh, or this city is uh, 14,000 people, so really teeny tiny port, teeny tiny city. Suddenly you have this huge cruise ship and, and the population of the city suddenly increases multiple times. So it's also connected to how government and how local people uh, are able to actually deal with these challenges. How, they, how, they, how far they adapt to this, including restaurants, public toilets, um, um, yeah. Um, souvenir shops and everything. It's important because then you have hundreds of th or thousands of people suddenly in the port and they don't have a place where to go to eat, you don't have a place where to go to the toilet. So if you really take it to the details, these are the challenges that also local communities and local cities throughout the Arctic are facing. And the tourism is definitely on, 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 uh, on, on increase. It's something that people want to do, it's really cool, and majority of, of those uh, retired US or British tourists uh, are eager to go to the Arctic and, and see that because they, they have money and they want to spend them, so that's nice. But we need to build an infrastructure and be ready to uh, be, be prepared for uh, the worst case scenario. If, uh, if you, you think about Costa Concordia, right, who haven't heard about it, it was in the Medi Mediterranean, it was near the coast. And yet, how many people, uh, people's lives were threatened? So if you imagine the scenario of Costa Concordia near the coastline of Iceland, 
not to mention somewhere far away in distant parts of the earth, just the coastline of the Iceland, of Iceland. Icelandic coast guards, they have two helicopters, each of them capacity 60 people. <laughs> So imagine a cruise ship with hundreds, not to mention thousands of people, and having um, having such a such a disaster. Uh, like uh, like you can imagine what might really happen if if, uh, if something would go wrong. And I think I'll yeah um, I already mentioned the newcomers um, and the role of. Uh, of, uh, of China and other Indian and uh, Asian, Asian countries, uh, Singapore, South, uh, South Korea, uh, and other, other players that are also coming and interested in the development uh, in the Arctic. And uh, Arctic states need to, they need to decide how they will approach and how they will react on those new challenges. So I would probably uh, leave it here and then I will be very happy for your questions and, and comments so we can get, have a little bit of, of a discussion. Thank you. <laughs>